Hi, I'm Tim Hubner, and I serve as the chair of the Board of Editors of the Journal of Supreme Court History. It is my pleasure to serve as the host of our series, Breaking History, where we highlight new scholarship on the history of the Supreme Court published in the Journal of Supreme Court History. With me today is Gabriel Valle, who is a recent uh, graduate of Georgetown University Law School. Welcome, Gabriel. Good to have you here with us. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for speaking with me. Well, uh, you have published a fascinating article in volume 48, uh, number one of the Journal of Supreme Court History. It's the it's the uh, uh, most recent uh, volume of the journal. It looks like this, and it's called A Hero Forgotten, uh, Gus Garcia and the Litigation of Hernandez uh, versus Texas, a 1954 case. Maybe you could tell us about the sort of two stories that you uh, that you sort of tell here. Uh, one has to do with the case itself, and the other has to do with this uh, forgotten hero, um, Gus uh, Garcia. So maybe starting with the case and on this. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so the case is not one you would expect to ever reach the Supreme Court. Um, it was a murder case in a very small town in Texas. Very clear that the guy did it. You know, it was almost no question. He was in a you know, by accounts of what was going on there in a fight in a bar, he left, he went home, he got his gun and he shot the person on the street in front of the bar. Seems like a pretty clear open and shut murder case. But being in Texas, there was a lot of discrimination against uh, Mexican Americans at the time. And in his jury trial, there was a question about whether they were excluded from the jury and they were. And so that kind of be, became the instigation for how to take this case up to the Supreme Court. And the person who saw that was Gus Garcia, who at the time was kind of a local legend there. Throughout Texas, he had litigated a bunch of case, cases concerning Mexican-American civil rights. He was by all accounts like this kind of wonder kid who was this incredible legal talent, had this amazing oral uh, ability to tell stories and to make arguments. And he had won a little bit of success in Texas um, in some earlier civil rights cases, um, working to uh, kind of integrate schools uh, between white students and Mexican-American students. Um, and so he was very well known there. And he took up the case um, kind of of his own volition. He did it for free, basically, because um, Hernandez couldn't afford to pay the legal fees. And he came up with the theory and with a couple other um, people who were famous in the kind of Mexican-American attorney community in Texas took this case all the way to the Supreme Court, um, which is quite incredible. And they did it on a very shoestring budget um, and saw in this kind of little small town murder case, the potential to change the 14th Amendment of the United States for the better for Mexican-Americans. Yeah, and maybe picking up on that, uh, talk a little bit more about the 14th um, Amendment and what the Supreme Court does in this case. I mean, it's interesting that when this case is is uh, sort of initially litigated in uh, Texas, there's sort of this two-class theory of the 14th Amendment and sort of what it meant. Maybe you can talk about that and how the U.S. Supreme Court changes that understanding of the 14th Amendment in the case. Yeah, so there's a couple things going on. So like you said, there's the two-class theory where it basically you know, protection for African Americans um, against discrimination, and it's kind of doing that dichotomy of white versus black. And that was the context of the 14th Amendment and what it was understood to be passed by. But within that, there was also in Texas the, the kind of unique issue of Mexican American versus white discrimination. And for a long time in Texas, Mexican Americans were kind of almost classified as white. So the judicial argument as it would go would be that, well, you can't discriminate on the basis of race there because you know, you're know you not treating white people any differently than any other white people. You're just excluding some white people versus others. And that's okay, You know, it's all within the same class. But when you got to the Supreme Court, because Garcia did a great job of explaining, well, that's not really the case. You know, We're treated differently in every other respect. There's signs all over town saying Mexican-Americans can't use the same bathroom. They can't go to the same schools. They can't 
uh, serve on the same juries. Um, so this kind of illusion of, well, no, everybody's white, you know, that's not real discrimination doesn't really hold up when you kind of shine a light to it. And the Supreme Court understood that, they saw that, and in their decision, they said, well, it really does go beyond this just kind of white black dichotomy. Um, there's real discrimination going on here. We need to address this and it's not permissible under the 14th Amendment. Right, and um, you argue then that uh, this case really is a landmark in the history of the civil rights of Mexican Americans and that it uh, you know, uh, 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 stands out um, in that way uh, for how the court is sort of reading the 14th Amendment uh, when it comes to service on juries. Um, just going back to uh, Gus Garcia, I mean, it's it's such an interesting story that you tell. And in some ways, it's kind of a tragic story because at the end, it uh, sounds like... Um, uh, Garcia's life ends prematurely. He had such promise and was uh, so good at uh, what he did, but his life was kind of tragically cut cut short. Maybe you could talk a little bit more about that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, he's incredibly talented, but also by all accounts, he had his own share of demons. Um, he struggled with alcohol for a lot of his life. Um, and it was a problem that only kind of got worse after that huge victory that he won in 1954. So he's someone who passed away, you know, in his mid forties, which is incredibly young. Um, and kind of before his full potential was realized, he hit this amazing pinnacle in his career. And then afterwards, unfortunately, it was kind of a downhill story where one thing snowballed after another, where his alcoholism got worse. He lost his license to practice. Um, there are letters from when he was in the hospital trying to get treatment for his addiction between him and his wife, where she's divorcing him. She's like, I can't really stay with him. It's just impossible to live with him. It's too hard with his drinking. And so he's going through that personal crisis as well. And he manages to regain his license for a little bit, but ultimately it just, it doesn't work out. And he meets a very tragic early end. Now it's, it's a very sad story, but an incredibly talented attorney. And it's a shame that you know, he died so prematurely. Yes, thank you for that observation and, and how you weave together these stories of the case and of uh, Gus Garcia is, just makes for fascinating reading. It's a really wonderful um, article. And, and it also sheds light on the dynamics on the court among the justices. So we know that ultimately the opinion is a uh, unanimous one, but also we know that, as is always true, there's a lot of back and forth. And tell us especially about Justice Felix Frankfurter and his sort of role in all of this. Yeah, so Justice Frankfurter was very interesting. Um, you know, you have to remember at the time, Chief Justice Warren was brand new to the court. Um, Frankfurter had been there for quite a bit of time. He was an FDR appointee. Um, and so you kind of have him taking on the role of an advisor a little bit as, you know, stepping into his law professor shoes again, as he loved to do, um, and kind of advising Justice Warren about kind of the big picture going on in the term. So Brown was up for its second time. It had been renewed. The justices had heard the cases earlier, but decided to defer. And so now we're in the 1954 term and they're going to decide the case. And Justice Frankfurter is very cognizant about this. He realizes this is going to be a huge step for the court. This is a huge amount of political capital that the court's going to expend. And so it has to be kind of aware of itself and what it's going to do here and how that's going to impact the rest of the cases for the term. So there's a, um, well, a memorandum, but really <laughs> quite a long one. Uh, Professor Felix Frankfurter was verbose is maybe the wrong word, but he loved, loved to write, loved to talk. Yeah. Um, and so you get kind of this four page memorandum um, explaining the situation that you know, Brown is coming up. There's going to be a lot of pushback from this decision. We're going to do a lot with the 14th Amendment, and it's going to be a monumental decision. Maybe don't be so sweeping with your decision here in the Hernandez case, which also involves a reinterpretation of the 14th Amendment. Make it on more narrow grounds and just save a little bit of that capital for Brown, which is coming out in a couple of weeks. 
So he was very cognizant of that and of the court's power and of the fact that the court has to rely to a certain degree on public opinion to get its opinions enforced um, and acceptance. It doesn't have its own power of the sword or power of the purse or anything like that. It's very reliant on public opinion. And so I think he was trying to speak to Warren about that, who certainly had experience as a governor and understood, you know, the public and public sentiment, but as a justice in writing opinions, um, kind of trying to give him a little bit of advice that way. Yes, and so even though Frankfurter kind of expresses these uh, uh, concerns in this memo, uh, Warren is able to bring him around and get him to sign on to this unanimous opinion, is that right? Yeah, so Frank Prater was always on board. He just wanted, he had a little bit of quibble with the language. He wasn't going to object to the opinion. He was very happy to go along with that, but he just wanted to make sure it wasn't going to go too far at one time. Right, yes, and of course, the Supreme Court always thinking about public opinion at the same time that it's establishing this important constitutional landmark in 1954. Yes, as you point out, at the very same time as Brown versus Board, and so the sort of justices have to think about how these two cases maybe will be understood by the public uh, since they're being handed down at the same time. Obviously, Brown has overshadowed the um, Hernandez case. Uh, uh, why is that? Maybe talk a little bit uh, more about uh, why this case is not very well known. I think it's not particularly well known, I think in large part, just because of the magnitude of Brown. Um, I mean, Brown is such a monumental decision that impacted almost the entire country, basically. I mean, there it was huge in the South, but also in the North, there was a lot of discussion and coverage of the case. Um, and also just the resistance that the case met and the number of follow-up decisions that, have to that had to happen as a result of the case. It wasn't kind of one and done at all. It was a decades long battle that's continuing um, even today. And Hernandez, I think, just didn't get the same degree of coverage. I think it was always going to be more of a local issue to the uh, kind of to Texas and the Southwest, that area. Um, but also, I think just the ability to get cases again covered at the Supreme Court, subsequent cases at that level, it never really had that kind of subsequent appeal process that a lot of the cases related to Brown has. So it wasn't just at that national level as much. I think that's probably a combination of factors that led to why the case didn't get the same name notoriety as Brown. Very good, and thank you very much. Yes, it is a fascinating story, the story of Gus Garcia, the story of Hernandez versus Texas in volume 48, uh, number one of the Journal of Supreme Court History. It uh, looks like this. So I urge you to read it. And I want to thank uh, Gabriel Valle for being with me here today. His article, once again, is A Hero Forgotten, Gus Garcia and the Litigation of um, Hernandez uh, versus Texas, uh, 19. 54. It's been a pleasure to talk with you today, Gabriel. Likewise. Thank you again so much for having me. It was awesome. Thank you so much.